I know this has been difficult, and I appreciate the way that you have forthrightly told the truth. At this time, I'm finished with this witness, Your Honor. Well, I couldn't help but notice that the uh, esteemed counsel didn't ask you anything about the bed and the fact that it was must or not. Truth be known, that bed was never laid down in one time, was it? Yes, sir, it was. That's what you're saying now? Yes, sir. You heard Sheriff Williams say, and you heard him say that others saw it, absolutely pristine. How do you answer that? It was hot. I laid on top of the covers. Oh, you laid on top of the covers. You seem like a, a, a rather extraordinarily uh, developed young woman for 16, and you're saying that laying on top of the covers, you didn't mess them up in the slightest. That's what you're telling these people? Yes, sir. When you went to Coney Island and you got back from Coney Island, it was rather late, wasn't it? Yes, sir. And you had words with your father about that, didn't you? No, sir. And you'd had words with him about other incidences when you were out late, have you not? No, sir. So you're telling these folks that everything was just hunky-dory at all times, no friction, no thing, no thing to, to upset you or cause you to have any anger. Is that what you're telling this jury? Yes, sir. Your father slept in August in Boone County. I know it's cold here. We're in December. Ponds are frozen over. We can't really appreciate that. But in August, with all the windows closed, all the doors locked. Wasn't that house hot? Very hot. Why did he do that? He didn't want anyone breaking in. Now, there's been testimony about these connections with the city. Did you ever hear of anything like that before, before this trial? Did your father ever say anything to you about a syndicate being involved in anything? No, I wasn't aware. Your sir. father was the vice mayor of Covington, was he not? Yes, sir. Didn't he get paid for that? Yes, sir. Did he have other opportunities and things he made money at? Yes, we owned a car dealership. Owned a car dealership. Did, uh, did his nightmares that he had that we've heard about in the opening address have anything to do with the way he ran the, par uh, the car dealership or did it run successfully? I'm not sure. Did you ever know him not to get enough sleep? Yes, sir. He usually went to bed around 9, didn't he? Did he ever wake you up rambling the halls or anything like that? Yes, sir. Oh, is that right? He was a restless sleeper. That was never revealed to Sheriff, Sheriff uh, Williams. I've never heard a word about that. Is that something new you've come up with today? Yes, sir. So you had nightmares. You had them and you're saying your father had them, so when you inherited them from him. And in this nightmare, you're saying that intruders were coming at you. They were firing bullets at you. You were shooting back, and you were shooting at them from what? An area in the hall aimed at a wall? Yes, sir. Let me ask you this. You sat in here. You heard the opening addresses. You know what's been happening. You read the papers at your disposal. You are aware, are you not? that the bullets through Carl's head are aimed right straight smack dab at him and went right through bullets right through him. Looked like a hog killing. Are you Objection, your honor. Would you please I, admonish I, I, this, Dean? I, I, I apologize to the court, sir. I, I, your honor, please, all I want in this room is justice to be done. And if you will forgive me, sir, for being so excited about the worst crime that's ever been committed in this county, sir, I'll try to hold it down a bit. Thank you, sir. If you were shooting at the wall and no bullets were found, but you insisted you were always shooting at the wall, I don't suppose you have any explanation at all as to why. Right straight down, right through his head, right into the pillow, he had bullets in him. Can you have an explanation for that? No, sir. Then what about Jerry? Was Jerry crying? Is that why you went in there? Yes, when I went in, my mama she asked me if I was having a nightmare and how did you answer her I told her no that there was crazy men in here he was gonna kill us all what did she say about did she tell you to go see the jury and said, he was crying check on Jerry. so crying. you went to see the jury and you eliminated the only other witness to the whole event almost except your mother lived and Jerry died in that effect <coughs> I didn't 
didn't mean to shoot Jared. Well, if you didn't mean to shoot Jared, he was so precious to you. Why, after all the terrible things that happened to you, you had a, you had, my God, you went to the hospital for her, you went to Jerry's funeral, you, you went to your father's funeral, and there hasn't been a shred of evidence that at any time you broke down and sobbed, and here's Jerry's little coffin, not much bigger than this. Do you have any explanation for that kind of demeanor? No, sir. That's all. Thank you. Your witness, redirect. Joan, isn't it in fact true, and it has been reported in the press, as a matter of fact, specifically the post of August of 1943, that you did in fact cry upon leaving the church, the mass that was the funeral for your father and brother. Isn't that in fact true? I'm sure I did cry at the funeral. This whole experience has been a blur. I don't remember when I cried. I certainly can understand that. Isn't it also true, Ms. Kiger, that on the evening in which Sheriff Williams and, and all of those folks from Kenton County were interrogating you alone, aside from your Uncle Fred, that you were in fact in shock? Isn't that in fact true? Yes, sir. And as a person in shock, you probably were not acting as a person would normally act under similar circumstances had they not been in shock. Isn't that true? Yes, sir. It happened so fast. I mean, by the time I drove down to Mr. Mayo's house and back, there were so many people that just came. It was a crazy house. I understand. Thank you, Joan, very much. John, I have Thank another you. couple of questions, if I may. Well, with all this happening so fast, you still had time to go downstairs, move the cistern aside, and put guns down in the cistern and bullets beside the guns. You had all kinds of time, didn't you? Objection, Your Honor. I the withdraw, I, Your Honor, I withdraw the question. The probative value is outweighed by the prejudicial effect of that. I withdrew the question, Your Honor. Withdraw. Then withdraw. We never did that. That was good. No, we never did that. Kevin, no other questions. Question. They stepped down. That's all right. At this time, Your Honor, the defense rests. Thank you. At this time, I will read the instructions to the jury, and then we will have closing remarks. Gentlemen, you will render a decision in this case based entirely on the evidence that you have duly heard in this courtroom. You will disregard anything that you have read or heard that was not directly presented to you in this room. You shall render a verdict as to this case against Joan Kiger, either guilty or not guilty. Mr. Sawyer, do you have closing remarks? Yes, Your Honor, I do. Esteemed colleague, Mr. Benson, Your Honor, gentlemen of the jury, gentlemen and friends of Boone County, may it please the court. You have now heard both sides of the story. Some 30 witnesses have made their way through this jury box, and you have heard testimony from each and every one of them. What you have heard, gentlemen, is that this little girl was a child, is a child, that any of us would be proud to call our own. You have heard evidence that on the night in question, August 17, 1943, acting under the influence of a night terror, again, something I know that we have difficulty grasping, but acting under the influence of a night terror, a nightmare from hell, this little girl, thinking that her family and her own life and 
their property was in danger, did indeed pick up a gun to defend her family and her own life. Again, I would ask you, who among us would not do the same? You have heard the evidence that on that night, our very own and much beloved Jake Williams, having been called by Bob Mayo, arrives on the scene, not to find the scene as it should have been found, that being Mrs. Kiger wounded and Joan Kiger in shock, but rather they found Joan Kiger in shock, Mrs. Kiger wounded, the deceased, and 10, if not 15 other people making their way all over the house, trampling the crime scene. People from Kent County. Of course, we know and have the utmost confidence in Sheriff Williams' ability. Truth be told, if Sheriff Williams had been left alone, we wouldn't be sitting here today. We would see this for what it actually is, and that is a little girl in a delirium acting under the influence of something that was as real to her as these proceedings are to us today. You've heard evidence that she is a model student. You've heard evidence that she and her family had a very close relationship, especially the relationship that existed between her and her little brother, Jerry. Little Jerry, six years old, the caboose of the family. She loved him. She loved him. There's nothing that could have happened that would have caused her to have harmed a hair on his head. You have heard evidence that she herself suffers from nightmares that her father before her suffered from as well. So there is a genetic link there, if you will, having passed from father to daughter. You have failed to hear any evidence proffered by the Commonwealth that this little girl had any intention whatsoever of hurting anybody. You have heard no evidence that there was a family rift. You've heard no evidence that there was a history of mental illness, for crying out loud. The only thing you've heard is that she suffered from a malady that deserves our pity rather than our condemnation. You have heard evidence, on the other hand, that Mr. Kyger, the vice mayor of Covington, who resided at, on Crescent Avenue in Covington, but yet had a palatial estate in New County. You heard evidence that the sheriff found in his investigation that there was $1,440 in cash found in the home, a sum that would take most of us a year, if not longer, to accumulate. And I know it's not very polite to bring it up, but we have heard that those were in fact the ill-gotten gains, if you will, from an association with the Cleveland City, which inspired in Carl an abnormal paranoia that his home was going to be broken into, that his family was gone because of those connections. So today, gentlemen, Having heard all of the evidence over this span of these five days, 30 witnesses, it's now time for you to retire to that jury room where you will consider amongst yourselves said evidence. And it will be your solemn duty to come back to these seats and render a verdict that will forever alter this young woman's life. Her life has already been irreparably damaged. But today, we, not we, but you, had the singular opportunity to set her on a path that can begin the healing. 
you have the opportunity to give her a chance in a somewhat normal life. You have the opportunity, gentlemen, to be the very steel and the sword of retribution and strike the chains that currently bind her to this room. And you've heard my esteemed colleague, Mr. Vincent, gesticulating wildly about all sorts of things. But today, I would submit to each of you, Mr. Vincent's only doing his job. But today, Mr. Vincent's job is not what is called for in convicting this little girl, but rather Mr. Vincent in the Commonwealth is a miserable merchant whose unwanted wares must remain unsold today. So I would implore you to go in that room and find her not guilty and come back out here and give her a chance at a whole new life. I thank you for your time and I thank you for your consideration. That concludes my remarks. Thank you. Mr. Benson. Gentlemen, on this cold December day, I'm right hot under the collar. I'd like to take this coat off. But I won't, without a deference to the court, my high respect and regard to Judge Yeager is the best jurist I ever knew. And probably, gentlemen, if you've never seen Sawyer Smith in action, you have now. And now you know why he has a reputation he does. He can weave a spell. Oh, can he forever and ever weave? Smooth as I, I oh, smooth as silk. Makes it sound good. Makes it sound good. But the simple fact is, oh, it reminds me, oh, it reminds me of the defendant who killed both of his parents and then threw himself on the person in the court because he was an orphan. Well, that's kind of what we have here. This poor little girl. This poor little girl. Magically, you knew how to shoot a gun as well as anybody, probably as well as any of you all. And you boys have had guns on your farm, in your hands, all your life. When she killed Kip, the Carl Kiger, if she'd have been the assassin that started World War I, she couldn't have shot any more accurately. Her bed wasn't bust up. Oh, you heard it all. I don't have to read you all that. The little Jerry. This demeanor of hers, this calm demeanor, part of her personality, my God, the way she talks like how much she loved little Jerry, he died of scarlet fever, a hooking cough. She'd have been in mourning, she'd have been crying for three days, maybe a week, maybe a month. I know I would have, lose one of my kids. None of that. Little Jerry was all that was left in the way. He was the one. He was the one crying. He was the one in the other room. And Mom said, go in and see the little Jerry. She saw it through him all right. That was the end of little Jerry. Oh, she wasn't in the throes of the nightmare from hell. Ladies, ladies and gentlemen, 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 and all the ladies in this audience who aren't on the jury, are well aware because you haven't left your common sense at the door. But she wasn't in the throes of any nightmare. She was in the throes of anger and revenge and viciousness and contempt. She was in the throes of a kind of a terrible, terrible anger like none I ever saw. Oh, they like can say like nightmare none, none you ever saw. Oh, that's an interesting that nightmare of the slip. That's Sawyer Smith has got the label all over that. You've heard 30 witnesses in a trial here this last three days. You've heard a psychiatrist from Lexington testify about night terrors. Let me tell you about expert witnesses, folks. They get paid for saying what you want them to say. That's what they are. They're always from some 50 miles away or more. 
they always agree with the guy that's paying them and brought them into the courtroom. You never heard any of the relatives brought in. You never heard the brothers testify. The brothers that are nice guys, handsome guys in the service of our country, they didn't say, well, gee, little Joni's had nightmares before, and so did Daddy. You never heard that, did you? Now, you didn't leave your common sense at the door, folks. The Commonwealth is seeking the ultimate penalty here. It may seem a little harsh. Because Sergeant Smith keeps referring to her as that little girl. So that little girl. I don't want to, I don't want to seem unkind. I've got children. But that, that's a woman from hell who killed her father almost killed her father, intended to, and killed her baby brother, and showed no remorse at all. Now she comes in here trying to bamboozle you. She can't do that without the help of Sawyer Smith. But probably the greatest trial lawyer I ever saw has come in here and made it sound so good. Listen, newspapers are covering this all the way from the New York Times to the Los Angeles Times. Every media in this country is covering this. You all ain't, aren't even supposed to have read the newspapers, but I've read them. I've seen them. This, this incident will be famous for years. Why, it wouldn't surprise me 50, 60 years from now, people aren't talking about this trial. Wouldn't surprise me at all the year 2000, even later, 2005 maybe, people aren't talking about this trial. Now, are we going to talk about it and say, that bunch of dummies down there, that bunch of hits turned somebody loose and pulled the trigger and killed her? Brother, her father, turned her and killed her mother. You all are a bunch of dicks. Oh, far from it. You are, I am too. We all got more sense than that. Do your duty, find her guilty, and let's get out of here and get back to the farm. Gentlemen, you will now retire. Consider your verdict. Gentlemen, have you reached a verdict? Yes, Your Honor. Haley, would you the verdict, please? finds the defendant, Joan Kiger, not guilty. I'd like to thank the jurors for taking their time and their service in this trial. I know it's been five days. I know that you've all had a lot to do and with Boone County appreciates your service. We will ask everyone to please stay seated if they would. Asa, I think you have a few things you'd like to say. Listen to me very carefully. Please. You have seen me in the role of our elders as the Commonwealth Attorney of Bill Circuit Court. Mr. Benson wasn't in the league for the darkness. He had a job to do. Lawyers do these things. They take pauses. They take positions. He, did, he was elected to do what he did. And my job tonight was to give to you the feeling and the demeanor and the speech patterns and all the rest as best I could of our own Now, listen carefully. 